han shan an tight road. I've heard of Emperor Wu of the Han, as well as the first emperor of Qin. Both were fond of techniques of immortality. In extending life, they didn't last long after all. The golden tower of the first already crumbled. The other finally met his end at Sandy Mound. On Mo Ling and Li Yue, the grasses spread far and wide today. So we continue with another short poem by Han Shan. Now, as opposed to the ones we've been reading lately, this one, because of its subject matter, could almost pass for a poem by a, by a scholar official. I mean, the, the topic of this poem is also very similar to the European, Latin, medieval topic of the Ubi Sunt, of where have the great kings, rulers, figures of antiquity gone to, which is, you know, a, a, a subgenre or a type of, 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 of poetry that is obsessed with, with, with depicting how glory, success, fame, uh, massive historical achievements are reduced to dust in the end because of common mortality. All must die and join the dust. So the, the, this topic is pretty common in a, a lot of Chinese scholar official poetry, uh, whether it is centered on emperors or whether it is centered on cities, on places of yore that were once like flourishing palaces or capitals. Um, so this sad nostalgia at the passage of time and at the mortality of human, not of the, or not only of the individual human condition, but of the global um, human condition, societies, dynasties, empires, rulers. Here's the key idea behind the poem. This poem focuses on two emperors, uh, which are quite similar. So the first emperor of Qin and Emperor Wu of Han. So Qin Shi Huangdi, the first emperor, uh, has generally been regard regarded somewhat hypocritically by the Chinese tradition almost from, 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 from his own time onwards as a tyrant, uh, the prototypical bad ruler, the prototypical hybristic tyrant. Um, and I say hypocritically because all of the imperial system after Qin Shi Huangdi finally managed to unify the warring states at the beginning of, of uh, the, 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 well not beginning, I think the middle years of, of the third century of, of our era, before our era, uh, BC. So uh, I think this was 250 BC approximately. So um, when the first emperor unified the empire, and he, he, he started a series of, well, he instituted the, the institutions of, and, and then the, the imperial institution itself, which would continue throughout Chinese history, the central bureaucracy, the division of the uh, empire into counties and um, above the counties, the, the, the uh, prefectships. And he made a, a massive plan of public works, including the Great Wall, or at least the rudimentary first version of the Great Wall, uh, massive road systems coming out from, from the capital, which was Xiangyang, and um, a military expansion into the north, and the territory of the Xiongnu, and into the south, and massive conscription of labor for doing public works. Now, the first emperor was hybristic. He was from the state of Qin and applied very harsh uh, laws with strict punishments, very harsh punishments. And uh, he probably, like a lot of emperors who unify the country after periods of disunion, definitely developed a, 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 an unlimited or partially unlimited notion of how far you could push uh, imperial power and resource extraction. And this sometimes leads to immediate consequences at the death of the emperor in, in rebellions or in civil war. And this is what happened with Qin Shi Huangdi. That is, he built the imperial structure, but immediately, or very shortly after his death, the whole house of cards came tumbling down. Uh, it was restored by, by a new dynasty, the Han, who very wisely managed to temper legalistic practice with a Confucian veneer of goodwill, so, so uh, an iron fist within a velvet glove, which would become the policy of, of traditional 
imperial dynasties. But as I said, this policy was built on denigrating the first emperor as the tyrant, uh, non-Confucian ruler who lived to excess, who practiced um, harsh military campaigns, harsh punishments, rejected Confucianism and had the scholars in their books burned and buried. And another element which would be commonly used as, as, as a source of mockery against uh, bad emperors is their search for immortality. So they're dabbling with alchemical practices and with, with frauds uh, who, who, who promised to find the secret of immortality and give it to the emperor. I like that Han Woody is also being um, latched to the first emperor here. Han Woody has a better reputation. He was an emperor of the Western Han Dynasty who had a very long reign. Uh, basically, he lived about a century after the first emperor. So his reign mostly encompasses, I think, from the 150s, 140s BC to about the 80s BC. So very, 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 one of the longest reigns in Chinese imperial history. Uh, and uh, he was more successful, but he is exact, for me, he is exactly <laughs> the, the first emperor revived. Like, he was also very harsh in his punishments. He led massive military campaigns, which greatly expanded the Han imperial domain. Like, he had many campaigns against the northern barbarians, the Xionyu, and took a lot of territory from them and settled it with Chinese settlers also expanded south, also was obsessed with immortality, and also was obsessed with building massive palaces in his capital, Chang'an, very close to the ancient uh, capital of the Qin, Shang, Chang'an. And uh, he has be better rap <laughs> because, you know, he was successful. His dynasty continued through his direct successes until the first years of our era and through uh, indirect uh, successes that trace their ancestry back to to Han Woody's father, I think. Uh, for another 200 years after that, the Han were one of the most successful Chinese dynasties, and, and they really created and consolidated China as we know it today. And, uh, you know, the name for the Han ethnicity is still the Han, uh, like the dynasty. But anyway, I, I particularly find Emperor Han Woody loathes him and as bad as the first emperor, as he exhausted the treasury in these military campaigns. And he was particularly obnoxious to one of my cultural heroes, Sima Qian, the grand historian, whom he had castrated because he praised a general who, facing unsurmountable odds, had had to surrender to the Xionyu in a military campaign. So, <laughs> cursed be the memory of Han Woody. Anyway, uh, both emperors, even though Han Woody has better rep, he was still um, viewed ambiguously and criticized by the more orthodox Confucians of later dynasties, as an example again of, 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 of um, hybristic rule. In fact, even in the later Han dynasty, so not too long after Han Woody, uh, it was pretty common in some poems to contrast um, the bad Western Han Dynasty, and especially Han Woody, with the better Eastern Han Dynasty. Anyway, after this long detour, very briefly, what does this poem talk about couplet by couplet? We mentioned the main topic, which is a, a lamentation of the, well, not more than lamentation, uh, um, a, a criticism of worldly ambition as epitomized by these two great rulers, Han Woody and Qin Shi Huangdi, and their attempts of immortality and how all rulers, including them, and all powerful figures, get brought down to the dust well, through the passage of time. We can't escape this world. So, not really a Buddhist theme. It, it has Buddhist elements, but, you know, Confucians were making the same type of poem, really. Okay, so let's take a look at it. Mm, so, first two couplets. I've heard of Emperor Wu of the Han, as well as the first emperor of Qin. Both were fond of techniques of immortality. In extending life, they didn't last long after all. So the first couplet presents us the rule as the great figures who everybody who is minimally schooled in China would have known, or even without any minimal schooling, the audience for this poem would have known them, even if it was a popular audience. So, so these emperors are famous. The focus is however, not on their glories or their success or their achievements, but on the fact that they searched for immortality and failed. These techniques were, you know, drinking elixirs, 
doing ascetic practices. These were common lore among the Taoists and other feng, feng shi, that is, uh, um, ascetic practitioners of esoteric arts. So these two emperors were interested in becoming immortal and prolonged their power and glory, but they failed. Next couplet. The golden tower of the first already crumbled. The other finally met his end at Sandy Mound. So this feels like a pluralistic couplet. We have two emperors, and uh, we have two um, metonymical uh, spaces associated with them. The golden tower for Han Wudi, and the Sandy Mound for the first emperor of Qin. I don't really know what the Golden Tower was. I do know that uh, Han Wudi embarked on an expensive and lavish construction spree in Chang'an. So this Golden Tower is probably one of the um, buildings he built in the Weiyang Palace or in the, in, the, in the Shangling Park. So these were constructions made of wood. It's an interesting thing as opposed to the ruins of uh, Roman emperors. The ruins of Chinese emperors are very scarce because only foundations usually survive made from from pressed ma compressed earth. Uh, because these constructions were spectacular, but were made of wood, and you know, they disappeared. The wood is very combustible. So this golden tower at the time of the Tang uh, no longer existed. There were very few ruins, probably, of, 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 of Han Chang'an surviving uh, uh, 500 years later at the time of the Tang. So this golden tower, which was so glorious, uh, a construction of Emperor Wu has been destroyed, it has crumbled away. And uh, in the case of the other emperor, also his palaces were destroyed, but the focus is put on Sandy Mound, which was a place he died at while he was doing one of his last tours around the empire. So anyway, both the deterioration of the tower and the place of death, the Sandy Mound, evoke this final death and transiency so long ago of these rulers. And finally, the last couplet. On Mo Ling in Li Jue, the grasses spur far and wide today. So the last um, couplet just hammers in the topic through their funerary mounds. That's Mo Ling in Li Jue, where the mausoleums of these emperors. In, in ancient times, it was typical to build on top of a whole hill, to construct a mound or, or, or build on top of a hill, a tomb for the emperor and a, a village of people living around to service the different rituals that had to be done at the emperor's tomb. So all that remains of those emperors and their constructions are their mausoleums. Mausoleums were close to the imperial capital, so they would have been in the area of Chang'an, uh, also at the Tang dynasty, not far away from Chang'an. Only the mounds remain, and there, not even the constructions remain, only the grass. The grass is spread far and wide. Grass also, very typical, uh, um, an image, an icon, a metaphor of transience, of the new generations coming year after year, coming and dying. Like new grasses with spring, they dry away in autumn. So the generations have passed, the people have passed, all the constructions of men, all their glories have disappeared. Yeah.